Fibroblation has been used for decades to manage uh, various conditions, cancerous and benign conditions. For example, it's been used for a long period of time managing liver tumors or renal tumors. More recently, it's been applied to manage breast tumors. Initially, fibroadenomas, but based upon recent experience and emerging data, it's been applied to manage breast cancers, and that's how we used it today. The first step before even taking the patient to the procedure room was to ultrasound and to document that the mass was still visible, that it hadn't changed significantly in size since the previous evaluation, and also to kind of get a general plan for how I would approach it. Would she be simply flat on her back? Would I have to rotate her with elevation of the chest? Would I come from the bottom of the breast, the lateral side of the breast, just to have a general plan for how to set up the case? Sometimes if you accidentally overshoot, which you never want to do, but if you do, you want to travel in the direction of the breast, not in the direction of the chest wall. So always approaching in the plane that would allow the probe to travel parallel to the chest wall is the safest thing to do with any you know, percutaneous breast procedure, probation as well. Typically I start with a 25 gauge needle to anesthetize the skin and then a 21 gauge needle or 22 gauge needle to anesthetize the tissue just beyond the skin and then I'll transition to a spinal needle 18 gauge and I'll use that to to inject uh, initially posterior to lesion and then anterior to lesion and then along the path that the crowd pro would take. It also kind of gives me an idea of which approach I should take to approach the lesion because sometimes, you know, the breast moves and, and it allows you to at least kind of do a trial run by insertion of the local anesthetic needle, you know, that would at least give me an idea of how I would approach the tumor with the cryoprobe. I also inject beyond the lesion because for a small lesion, as you know, the cryoprobe has to project not just into but past the lesion. So if you haven't anesthetized the tissue, past lesion, patients will often complain of pain in that location when the crowd probe is introduced. So the idea is to inject liberally uh, local anesthetic. Usually that's the most uncomfortable part of the procedure. The rest is relatively pain free. So if you are attentive to injecting local anesthetic up front, it's a relatively easy procedure for patients to tolerate from that point on. The general setup for the case is to have a sterile drape for the breast, uh, sterile gel to be used during the procedure, and then a series of syringes containing solutions. So you use typically three syringes, each 10 cc's of local. It can be a mixture of marcane and lidocaine. There's an additional syringe, 30 cc's, that are used for injection of saline. There's a scalpel. Uh, there's, as, as I indicated, um, serial needles, 25 gauge, 22 gauge, 18 gauge spinal needle, scalpel, 11 blade typically, and then there's a sterile transducer cover. Those are the typical components. Of course, gauze as well. In addition to positioning the cryo probe in the center of the lesion, it's also important to position the length of the cryo probe within the lesion so that the lesion is ideally positioned within the aperture that actually freezes, a segment of the cryo probe that actually freezes. And fortunately, there's a formula that allows you to determine how far beyond the tumor the cryo probe should be inserted so that you can properly position the lesion within the freezing segment, the uninsulated freezing segment of the cryopro. Evaluating the ice ball, you have to assess all dimensions, width and length. The ice ball is oval, so if you have an oval lesion, you want to orient the oval lesion it's sort of ideally within the oval ice ball, so the long axis of both should align. And monitoring you know, the procedure, we always see the long dimension emerge first. The ice ball freezes along the probe shaft. That's a very long dimension. The short axis, the transverse dimension, is often quite short. It starts off quite short, but over a period of minutes, it grows to fill the, the monitor, the ultrasound monitor. So it goes from you know, a few millimeters to three and a half or four centimeters over the course of the initial freeze. So you want to monitor that. Of course, that dimension gives you your lateral margins to the lesion. So if you have a lesion that's one centimeter 
along the short axis, you want to have a nice bow that's at least three centimeters in diameter in order to, for you to have a generous margin on opposite sides of that. So obviously every case is different, but ultimately you want to recognize that the ice bow freezes a limited volume and you want to use that volume efficiently. So the lesion should be perfectly centered within that volume to maximize the margins in all directions. So hydrodissection is a really a core part of performing crown bleaching procedures. As surgeons, we use it in many ways in, 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 our, in our practices, but in the setting of cryoablation, the goal is to use hydrodissection as a way to maintain distance between the skin and the ice ball. A main concern that we have with cryoablation is not causing a thermal injury to the skin. We can protect the skin as long as we can buffer it by injection of saline. To, to maintain the distance. So the injection of saline between the ice ball and skin is hydrodissection. And from my perspective, as long as you can manage to get saline between the skin and the lesion, or skin and the ice ball, you can freeze any lesion. Whether it's close to the skin or far away, as the ice ball grows, it will emerge, it will approach the skin. Injection of saline at that location will allow you to continue to grow the ice ball. If it's a lesion that's close to the skin to begin with, as long as you can push the skin away, you can cryoblate it. The breasts can absorb the saline. It will absorb it over the course of the next one to two days, and patients can tolerate that very well. So I usually have about 100 cc's of saline available. Sometimes we use more. Uh, but by using the, you know, the syringe and the extension tube set up, which is attached to the needle, I can continually change the syringe to inject as much saline as I need to maintain distance. The way that I approach cryoblation as a surgeon is that I'm trying to achieve with cryoblation what I would ultimately try to achieve with surgery. In surgery, our goal is to remove a tumor with clear margins, and we accept margins as narrow as non-transection, no tumor on each less than a millimeter, as long as the margins are clear. Of course, with cryoblation, we don't have the ability to check margins, so we have to assume that the tumor is potentially larger than we think it is and treat with a generous margin. And so instead of accepting a one millimeter margin as I would accept in surgery, my goal is to try to ablate at least a five to 10 millimeter margin with cryoblation, recognizing that the tumor might be a few millimeters larger than it actually appears on, on ultrasound. So the goal is to achieve a five to 10 millimeter margin. And you can do that by simply using the standard, you know, eight, 10, eight, freeze, thaw, freeze cycle for typical one and a half centimeter tumor. Or you can add additional time to the either freeze cycle to grow the ice ball to a larger dimension. And there are even cases that, you know, where sometimes they use two overlapping uh, ice balls to free a much larger margin around potentially a larger tumor. There are situations, however, where it is so uh, adherent to the mass or close to the mass where we can't feel like it can safely inject saline or local. In those cases, we or I treat not just the mass but the adjacent muscle as well because the muscle is in fact the margin that needs to be addressed with cryobation. <laughs> The idea behind the freeze-thaw freeze approach is that both components, the freeze component and the thaw component, induces an injury, a mechanical injury to the cells. And so it's crucial to exploit the ability of both of them to induce a cryogenic injury. Freezing causes icicle formation within cells, which causes injury to the cytoskeleton and also damages the cell wall. Freezing also causes icicles to form between cells in the extracellular space, which dehydrates the extracellular space. That causes fluid within the cell to flow from within the cell to the extracellular space to balance the, the osmotic gradient. In the process of freezing, that's what you're trying to do. And then in the thaw phase, once the extracellular cell space starts to thaw, the fluid flows back into the cells that causes the cells which shrunk because they were dehydrated to begin to expand again because they're being rehydrated, but they're damaged cells that are rehydrated and damaged cells that can't maintain the cytoskeleton rupture. So the idea behind you know, the freezing and thawing is to injure the cells osmotically, injure the cells 
uh, mechanically by ice crystal formation. Uh, and of course, there are other changes that happen as well, in vascular injury, immunogenic injury, and other apoptotic injury, other things that, that induce the effect that leads to cellular damage, cellular disruption, and cellular necrosis. Patient aftercare is the easiest part of all. We apply a steroid strip to the, to the wound. I apply antibiotic ointment to the uh, place where I've injected saline multiple times, if it's a case that requires multiple saline injections. And then I ask the patient to wear gauze on the wound, uh, which is held in place by a bra. Typically, I advise patients to wear a sports bra because there will be some swelling from the saline injection, swelling from the injury from cryoblation, and the sports bra will help to reduce the swelling. I tell them to expect bruising. It's often quite dramatic. It tends to peak about the third to fifth day, but it should be gone by the tenth day. And as long as they anticipate that, they're fine. I usually show them a picture after they undergo cryoblation so that they know what to expect. And for many people, they say, I'm so glad you showed me that because I would have reacted to that and might have been alarmed. But knowing that bruising is normal after this, as it is with many percutaneous procedures, they're relieved that uh, that's the normal course. In addition, uh, there's no significant activity restrictions. I tell them that they can go back to their normal activities, normal non-strenuous, non-forceful sports-like activities. So self-care, wound care, they drive themselves in, they drive themselves home. Uh, they can maintain normal, non-strenuous activities and resume them the very next day. One of the minor challenges with performing cryoblation using the standard ultrasound instruments is that the dimensions of the ice ball are larger than the transducer foot plate, so you can't measure it all in one view. So one tool that I use, a strategy that I use, is to insert a needle in front of the ice ball, like in the skin. Either I use a needle that's already in place for hydrodissection, or I insert a needle halfway along the length of the ice ball. The needle will appear on the image once you insert it, and then you can measure from the needle to one end of the ice ball and the needle to the other end of the ice ball and just add those two measurements together to get your final ice ball length. And then if you can't measure the other dimension, take the needle out and put it in at a right angle to the first insertion and then measure the other two distances. So that's how we get an accurate measurement uh, of the ice ball dimension. We measure it in two parts using the needle inserted between the skin and ice ball as a reference point for measuring. Sometimes the needle projects a nice line, but even if it doesn't, you'll see it right below the skin and, and can use that as reference points. Cryoblation is one to, if indeed, you know, it can ablate a tumor, if you can see the tumor well, then there's no reason that it can't be considered for a larger tumor. So for me, my criteria are it has to be a well-characterized tumor, even if it's larger than two centimeters, if I can map out the dimensions of it, then you can corroborate whatever volume that is required to clear that tumor with clear margins. The other challenging scenario that uh, we've uh, been treating quite regularly are patients with DCIS. DCIS is typically not ultrasound visible, therefore it becomes a challenge to target with ultrasound guidance, but there are some solutions that one can apply to convert an ultrasound invisible tumor to an ultrasound visible target. We simply uh, arrange for our radiologist to insert under mammographic guidance an ultrasound visible marker. Uh, the marker can be placed in the center of a small lesion or opposite ends of a larger lesion, and then we can use those ultrasound visible markers as reference points to target the cryoprobe. So, although the ideal case for someone embarking on uh, cryoblation for the first time is to go after the small, well-defined, well-characterized lesions that are easy to reach, easy to target, they will find, once they develop some experience, that patients will push them to take on greater challenges. That's how I took on these greater challenges. The standard protocol that we use for post cryoblation imaging is ipsilateral mammogram, ipsilateral ultrasound, and breast MRI performed six months post cryoblation. Uh, the main goal is to have the best assessment of the breast anatomy uh, because none of the studies are good enough to exclude the presence of residual malignancy. So 
we use a combination of the three to have an understanding of what remains, but also to provide a, a foundation or a reference point for subsequent imaging. Uh, ultrasound uh, is very good at looking at distortions, and so we typically will see an area of injury that's well circumscribed, but it isn't really good enough to tell you that there isn't residual tumor at the center of that area of cryovation. So we look for other things. A mammogram will show you an area of density, generally outlining the, the borders of the uh, ablation zone. But over time, what we expect to see is lucency in the center as opposed to a density, which is what was present before you know, the cryovation was done. And then in the case of breast MRI, we typically see an enhancing rim that has no enhancement near the center or minimal enhancement near the center. Certainly, you'd like to see no enhancement where there was previously enhancement corresponding to the site of malignancy. I think that, you know, to some degree that might be over-imaging, but very few people know what a post cryovation breast should look like. Certainly most radiologists don't know. And so, you know, building the sort of the data set so that we have some experience with looking at breasts at different times points, it's really important. We also recommend a core biopsy at six months because, again, none of the studies are really definitive and excluding the presence of residual malignancy. Many patients and certainly many providers have considerable anxiety about examining a post cryovation patient because they're concerned that they can't be sure that cancer doesn't remain, especially if they feel a lump. In fact, the lump is generally bigger, so many of them think that the, lump, the tumor has progressed. But giving them their assurance that there is you know, only fat necrosis or fibrosis corresponding to MS lowers their anxiety tremendously, which also has a benefit of lowering the patient's anxiety about their clinical findings.